Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and tonight we're going to wander through the hallways and rooms of homes that have a few too many residents. Whether you've lived in a haunted house before, or simply gaze suspiciously at that one house in town you're sure harbors some chilling secrets, you've no doubt heard tales of knocks in the night found themselves living among the dead. If you're brave enough, then get comfortable, grab some coffee or tea, and get ready to take another journey into the night. I love haunted walks. I've been on at least six or seven that immediately come to mind. I also come from a long line of, let's say, paranormally sensitive women, so I've been experiencing the unexplained my entire life. Not constantly, but often enough that to me it's just common knowledge that these things happen. So when I go on a haunted walk, usually the people I'm with are watching me as much as they're watching the dark corners of the room. A few years ago, I used to run a hotel. It was a vintage building that had been around since the 1800s, but I'm sad to report that nothing paranormal ever happened in the hotel. Despite its age and unique history, I checked every single room of that building, every single day, completely alone, and I never saw any evidence of the paranormal at all. No guest ever reported anything weirder than the crappy AC not working because the owner was too cheap to replace it. Once we had a maid claim that the lar- I'm sorry to say it guys, but I have zero scary stories about the hotel. However, it does play a part because, as a hotel manager, I would often get free or discounted tickets to events and tourist attractions around the city. These tickets were meant to be used by myself and our front desk staff, so that if a guest ever asked what fun activities in the city should I make sure to see during my stay, the staff could honestly recommend places that they'd definitely been to and give them a genuine account of how they enjoyed their experience. One October, I received tickets to the haunted tour that was always appearing during the few weeks leading up to Halloween. My front desk manager and I were the only two who were brave enough to go. I had already been on several haunted walks across the country, and she had heard a few of my spooky life experiences, so she was very eager to come too. Plus, we had become best friends, so it was great to hang out together outside of work. I wanted to protect her privacy, so let's call her Allie. My husband, of course, came too, as he is always my sidekick during haunted walks. All but one, but that's another story. The tour we decided to take included a walking tour of haunted locations in town and finished with an internal tour of the most famously haunted house in our city, possibly our country. I won't tell you the name of the house to protect my privacy, no offense. I'll just call the house the governor's house. The walking tour before the big event was, as always, awesome. Very interesting stories, but since we didn't actually go into any of the reportedly haunted houses, nothing truly exceptional happened. However, I do remember that I had a growing need to pee. At one point, I actually swallowed my pride and asked our tour guide if we'd be seeing a haunted coffee shop so I could pop in to use the washroom. But much to my horror, she told me, oh, sorry, no, but there's a bathroom in the governor's house and the plumbing still works, so you can use that. I don't think the caretakers will mind. With a blank stare on my face, I looked at her and hesitantly replied, it's okay, I'll hold it. But by the time we got to the house, holding it wasn't an option. She gave us a brief history of the house and a retelling of the reported paranormal events that had happened there. Apparently, the governor and his wife lived in the house. They ran the city until one day an angry mob of townsfolk broke in, ransacked the place, and murdered them both. Since then, the caretakers who used to reside in the house have experienced a lot of unexplained noises, objects moving on their own, 
and worst of all, being violently shaken or slapped awake in the middle of the night, but then opening their eyes to see that nobody was there. Needless to say, they no longer live in the house. Absolutely bursting with urgency, the first thing I did when we got into the house was lock myself in the first bathroom I saw. It was very tiny, very dark, and definitely the last creepy place I wanted to be without my pants on. Not to my surprise, there was no line up to use it. I just said, okay ghosts, just hold off for a few minutes, okay? Let me have my privacy in here, and then you can do anything you want to me. I really should know better than to offer spirits a deal, but I was desperate, and I didn't want to spend the rest of the night with urine so jeans on on a cold October night in front of my staff. Yeah, I had some clear priorities. When I emerged from the bathroom, everyone on the tour looked at me like I was nuts for going in there alone. Each one of them would gladly have chosen to pee their pants. The guide gave us permission to walk around the house freely, as long as we were careful not to break or take anything. Allie was eager to have her first ever ghost encounter, so the first thing she did was make us go down into the basement. One of the stories that the guide told us about was a rocking chair that was known to rock on its own, so Allie was determined to find it. And since nobody else was willing to go down to the basement, we had it completely to ourselves. Once we were downstairs, we saw three rooms. One was just a closet of mops and the other cleaning supplies. Chores are very scary. And to the left of it was an archway leading into a pitch black room. I thought it strange that this was the only room in the house that didn't have the lights on. And to our immediate left at the foot of the stairs was the kitchen which also had its own archway to the dark room. We decided to explore the kitchen first and followed her. This room was so dark that as you entered it, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, which was weird because it was right next to the very brightly lit kitchen through a large open doorway, but no light dripped in. You could turn around and see the kitchen and you could see the faint street lights through the window but the actual room itself was pitch black. Not wanting to accidentally bump into and break any priceless antiques, I took out my camera and started to aimlessly snap photos to get the light from the flash. It actually didn't occur to me until this very moment that I should have used the flashlight app on my phone, but during creepy moments you're prone to make quick and odd decisions. Every time I snapped a photo, I got a blink into the room. It was a dining room with a large wooden table dead center, but it wasn't the furniture that really caught my eye. It was the footprints. It's hard for me to really explain it, but every time I took another photo, I could see large, bright blue footprints on the floor, two at a time, making their way around the table and coming closer. After about four or five photos, I was pretty sure that I saw what I saw, so I backed up, back into the kitchen, back into the light. My husband and Allie looked at me. I never noticed Allie pass me to go back into the kitchen. My face must have been pale. They asked me what happened. All I said was, I'll trick him. Then I dashed to the other archway that led into the dark room from the hallway expecting to snap a photo of the full body of the entity waiting for me near the kitchen. But I was so wrong. The only one about to be tricked was me, because when I took that picture and the camera flashed, all I could see was bright blue flashing right up in my eyes, an inch from my face. He was right there, right in front of me. He was smarter than me, and he wanted to make sure that I knew it. I stumbled back and went straight up the stairs, just repeating, I'm sorry, you win. Allie and my husband quickly followed. Despite the weird encounter seconds earlier, we still wanted to see the rest. They were small rooms that were chained off to stop visitors from breaking anything. After that, we left and stood out under a streetlight out front of the house to recount our experience. While my husband and Allie chatted, I decided to take one last photo at the property this time from the outside. 
I didn't notice it at first, but while we were in the house, every light in the house was on except for the dark room in the basement. But now, not two seconds later, looking into the house from the outside, it was reversed. Every light in the house was off except for the dark room in the basement where I could clearly see the rocking chair on the other side of the dining room table by the window. Another strange thing happened that night, one that was absolutely frightening. None of the photos that I took in that house were actually on my camera, not a single one saved. My husband had even worse luck, as he told me that the moment we walked into the house, his fully charged camera just completely dropped dead, a flat, empty battery the moment he crossed the threshold. But the most terrifying thing that I saw that night was that picture I took from outside the house. If you had looked up to the second story window in the master bedroom, there were two distinct bright yellow eyes floating in the darkness of the house staring directly at us down on the street below. When I showed this picture to my husband, he was so freaked out by it that he asked me to delete it immediately because he didn't want it in our house. Being sneaky, I remember saving it on Facebook before I deleted the photo from my phone so I could share it with my friends. But after Halloween that year, I haven't been able to find the photo. It has completely vanished and nobody that I know can find the copies that they saved of it either. My name is Jordan. I was a young kid of seven years old when this happened. I have an older sister by a year. I'll call her Jess. We were both being raised by my mother, whom I'll call, you know, mom. <laughs> she began a relationship with her boyfriend that we will name Derek. We moved into a house in West Bountiful, Utah. The house sat near a horse farm that sat north from the house, away from the road about 50 yards from the back door. The house had two wagon wheels buried into the ground halfway for decoration sitting near the street. We had an elderly lady as a neighbor who lived to the east of us. The next house east was my friend Brian's house. The house was kind of old, but still in good shape. Walking into the front door led you into the living room. The stairs to the right led upstairs, where the bathroom was first on the left, followed by my sister's room to the right, then my mom's room on the left, and my room on the right at the end of the hall. Past the living room was a kitchen that to the left led to the driveway. The right led downstairs to another living room. This was adapted into a place where I had my N64 set up on a tiny TV. While going down the stairs, there was a crawl space to the right next to the furnace. Since being seven years old, I can't recall how long we lived in this house before things started becoming strange, but to my mom and sister's recollections, the first oddities we noticed was that deep into the night, the toilet would flush randomly. I never noticed this since my room was farthest from the bathroom, but my sister and mom were both convinced that I was being mischievous and was doing it on purpose. I do remember them asking me if I really needed to pee last night, but I said I had no idea what they were talking about. Weeks later, the toilet flushing became a common occurrence at night. I heard it happen as I was walking to the bathroom one night, so I turned around and went back to bed obviously nervous. The next day, Derek said it had to be pressure in the sewer causing our toilets to flush. I took his word strongly since I thought he knew all about plumbing. But toilet flushing started to become boring, I assume. For after a pause in the activity, faucets in both the bathroom and the kitchen were both suddenly blasting water out of them, the knobs opening up completely. Derek sprang awake to the sound of rushing faucets and quickly shut them off. After he turned off the kitchen faucet and walked back up the stairs, the toilet flushed as he passed by the bathroom. I slept through this entire ordeal, but my mother says that it made him so mad he kicked the bathroom door. The faucets joined the toilet in becoming a common plaything at night, and all of us fell into living in that house. 
My friend Brian came over and we were playing Smash Brothers on my Nintendo 64 in the basement. After several matches, he needed to use the bathroom, so he got up and ran up the stairs. I kept playing. He came running down the stairs. I thought he was just excited to keep playing, but he stood there next to me, gasping, eyes as wide as dinner plates. He stumbled with his words as he asked if there was something wrong with my bathroom. Before I could say anything, he starts frantically explaining that the toilet flushed right before he got to the door, and as he was done and was leaving, the faucet turned on in full power right behind him. I told him that that's been happening many times, but only at night. Brian wanted to go back home after that. He didn't look back as he walked down the street. I was sad. I was sure that Brian wouldn't want to hang out anymore after the house scared him. This was from what I recall as the first time someone from the outside experienced our house's oddities. I told my mom about it, and she said that it was strange that it happened during the day. There were times that my sister and I would stay weekends with our dad every other weekend. One of these weekends, my mother and Derek were in bed. She can't recall what time at night it was, but out of a sound sleep, she could hear soft sobbing from a woman. She laid there, half asleep, wondering if she'd left the TV on in the living room. But the sound wasn't coming from downstairs. In fact, the sound seemed to be coming from the room they were turned into a cry of unimaginable pain, as if the woman was either being tortured or in pain of losing a child. Derek got quickly dressed, saying that the neighbor lady next door might be hurt. He ran out the front door and over to the neighbor's house. But by the time he got to her door, there was no screaming or crying. He slowly walked toward the house, and the crying got louder. There was no mistake that it was coming from our house. Derek checked every square inch of the house when he got back, and there was no one but him and my mom in the house. And as soon as it appeared, it stopped. My mom says that was one of the hardest nights sleep of her entire life. One that I was present for happened about a month after the night of the crying woman. It's of course in the dead of night. As we're all sleeping in our rooms, suddenly my mom and Derek were awoken by a blinding light, as bright as a lighthouse. My mother and Derek sprang up and tried to find the light switch, but as soon as they flipped it, the light stayed. Derek thought maybe a semi-truck was shining his brights through their window, but he opened the window and noticed that their window was facing the horse farm. They had no window facing the streets at all. As soon as he spun back around from looking outside, the light died out. I remember the commotion afterwards. Derek was running all over the house in a panic. He checked the fuse box, grabbed his tools, and tore apart their light fixture at 3 a.m., trying to find a natural explanation and shouting in frustration the entire time. My mother would stay up late most nights. She loved her horror movies and crime shows, so she'd watch them while we were asleep. It wasn't far from midnight when my mom heard the voices of children giggling. The only light in the house was the TV. She assumed my sister and I were trying to scare her, so she pointed at the stairs and said, Both of you, go to bed now. The giggling continued for a little longer before my mom stood up and marched to the stairs to find that nobody was there, but still the giggling was getting louder. She came up the stairs and opened my sister's door to find her asleep in her bed. She checked into my room and found me the same way. After she went down the stairs again, the giggling finally stopped. My mom claims that afterward she sat there and thought of the woman crying a while before this occurrence and thought that these children giggling had some morbid connection. My mom caught the elderly neighbor one morning in her driveway and asked if she knew anything about our house. The lady said she lived on that street for half of her life and never heard or saw anything bad happening inside of the home, just families moving in and out over the years. We never looked further into this theory. The time passes and we now refer to our ghostly friends as the kids and the lady. The kids love to play around in mine and my sister's rooms. They'd open and close our closets, slam my sister's hope chest to startle us, 
and still loved to play with the toilet at night. Of course, being now eight years old, I had a constant uneasy feeling in that house. My mother would assure me that our ghosts were a happy family that needed a place to stay, but this did not settle my fears at all. I had grown accustomed to having multiple light sources in my room. A lava lamp, two plasma balls, and a fiber optic light. All of them were on the headboard of my bed. I needed these on at all times to feel comfortable enough to sleep. When they were on, I never had anything happen in that room. My mom and Derek understood that I needed them on and never touched them while I slept. But from time to time, I would wake up to find that some, if not all, of my lights had been switched off. Not just the power strip they were plugged into, but the little clicky knobs on the wires themselves. I'd usually wake up late at night to pitch darkness and scramble out of fear to get my lights back up and working. One night, after turning them all back on, I noticed the closet door, which was closed when I went to sleep, was wide open. That was all. This next part is rather hard for me. I write this with goosebumps all over me. I had a very gruesome dream that I could only describe as a horror that no young boy could ever dream of. I was sitting in a room in the house in dress clothes and I was crying. Loud bangs to the door of the room and a hellish scream echoed throughout the empty room. And I huddled into a corner and screamed. The room went dark for a shadow as the door opened. I couldn't see what was in the doorway, but I kept screaming for whatever it was to stay away. Silence fell. For what seemed like an hour, I sat there in the corner, staring at the blackness of the door. When suddenly, people came walking in through the shadows. They were all my family. From my mom and dad to my sister and even a couple of cousins, I didn't leave the corner to greet them. They all stood there, staring at me with pale faces and glazed eyes. My sister smiled eerily at me and would take stiff, awkward steps toward me. I'd scream and she would step back and giggle at me. My dad walked up to me, towering over me. As he knelt down to my level, his eyes went from glazed and dull to being void. Void of anything except for darkness, with small glints of light for pupils. I cowered in fear, turning my head from him. Then he grabbed the top of my head and forced me to stare him in the face, and said, You have to say your goodbyes or they're going to be lonely in heaven. Jess screamed in a shrieking voice as my dad grabbed me by the ankles and held me upside down. I was equal height to his face. I could see all the faces of my relatives at that moment, and they all had the same eyes as my dad, but they had gaping, bleeding mouths. It was almost like their jaws were nearly torn off. They all chanted the word heaven over and over as they carried me into a living room where a bed was set up. In the bed was a corpse. It was my sister. Still held by the ankle, they held me above the corpse of my sister. I still remember every detail of her face. Her skin was olive green and white, and her skin was cracking in places. Her eyes were cold, cloudy, and lifeless. I stared at her face in shock and disbelief. One of her eyes moved and stared back at me before suddenly she sprang from the bed and wrapped her arms around me, pulling me into the bed. She screamed and shrieked as she wrapped her rotting fingers around my neck and began to choke me. I screamed with my last breath for someone to come and rescue me. But the last moment I saw was my sister placing her thumbs over my eyes and pressing in. I could feel the pain of my eyes popping and all I could do was scream. I was suddenly woken by my mother. Apparently, I was shouting in my sleep and flailing uncontrollably for several minutes before she could get me to open my eyes. Not to my surprise, every single light was off in my room. I could barely see my mom's face as she held me in her arms. I was in complete shock, shaking violently, unable to speak. Darting my gaze over every inch of the room looking for the demons that nearly had me, I struggled to grab my mom's arms and stuttered, asking where Jess was. 
At that moment, Jess, who had been awoken by the noise I was making, flipped on the light as she walked in. Upon seeing her, I broke into a complete nervous breakdown where I tried to crawl away from her, still choking on absolute terror and unable to scream. I grunted and wheezed at her, and tears poured out of my face like a waterfall. My mom told Jess to go back to bed. She left the room and asked my mom if I wanted to stay the night in her bed. I couldn't answer. I was still in total shock. She picked me up out of bed and took me into her room and put me in the spot next to her. She threw blankets over me and said to try to get some sleep. I laid there shaking like a leaf, the dream playing on repeat through my head as I trembled. Not even being near my mom made me feel safe at that point. I remember being like that for hours afterwards. The exhaustion finally caught up to me and I fell asleep once again. My mother says that when she looked at me in the morning, she noticed that I slept through the remainder of the night with my eyes open. I woke up a couple of hours later in a haze. My entire body felt heavy and weak. I made my way downstairs where my mom and sister were. They asked me what I had dreamt about and it all flooded into my head again and I started crying hysterically. It would be several years later when I could finally tell them what the dream had been about. My mom had called the school and let me stay home that day. She asked if I was hungry, but food was the last thing on my mind. She led me to a room and said I should nap more since it's daytime and that will keep things peaceful. I laid in my bed under the covers and wept. A chill ran through my spine and I stopped crying. Listening carefully, I could hear a whisper of a child. Shh, shh, don't worry. It'll be okay. I laid there, frozen. I slowly pulled the blanket from over my eyes, just to witness my closet slowly closing itself. I stared at it quietly for some time before hopping out of bed and running down to the living room. I didn't tell my mom about the closet or the whispering voice. I knew she would just blame it on the dream I had had, so I kept that one a secret for a couple of years. My mom now believes me, now that I've told her everything that happened while we were going over our experiences together. Weeks later, my aunt Dana stayed with us for a week. It was a weekend where we were going to my dad's house. My mom and aunt were alone in the house while Derek was at work. My mom was watching General Hospital and my aunt was using the shower. My aunt came running down the stairs out of nowhere, pale as a ghost. She asked my mom if she walked into the bathroom a moment earlier. My mom said no, of course not. My aunt describes looking through the foggy shower door and seeing a woman with blonde hair in the bathroom staring at the mirror. My mother has brown hair. She then turned and walked out without making a sound or speaking a word. My aunt stared back up at the bathroom. He remembers the incident from before and asks how it was going living at a haunted house. I said it wasn't all that bad, jokingly of course. I didn't tell Brian about any of my personal stories for fear he might end our friendship over it. The night hit about 11pm and we switched from games to cartoons. We both fell asleep with the glow of my tiny TV on us, and everything was fine until I was shaken awake by Brian. He was hysterical. He grabbed me and pulled me close and said, I hear them. They giggle at me when I'm sleeping. There's something wrong with this house. I want to go home. Please let me go home. His scream woke my mom up and she ran down the stairs to find Brian hyperventilating. She grabbed all of his belongings and walked him out of the house after he calmed down and down the street to his own house. She came back and said that Brian's dad didn't want his son to come over just to get scared to death. Frankly, I don't blame him. He still comes over sometimes, but he never stayed the night again. He especially avoided the basement from that moment on. There were a couple more parts to this story, but they played out similarly to most of the other activity. My mom's relationship with Derek came to an end, and we were packing to move to a different city. After all our belongings were removed, we walked slowly through parts of the house talking about our stories of creepy happenings. My sister and I, feeling a bit brave due to us leaving and never coming back, 
had a surge of courage to ask the kids if they liked playing with us. It was dead silent in the house. My sister and I giggled to each other and said they probably hated playing with us because we were annoying. My mom says she felt something a bit different. Almost like that there were a couple of people who were sad to see us go, and Derek also felt the same vibe. But after two years in the house in West Bountiful, we left. My mom and I still bring up the stories from time to time. We both get goosebumps from the blinding light story, and she's blown away by how terrible my dream was. I recently revisited that dream a month ago, not to my choosing, of course, played out the exact same as that night when I was eight years old. Only this time I woke up calmly and shook it off. It was that repeat dream that I had that made me decide to write what I can only call a ghost story. It may appear as fiction, but to us it was a reality. It saddens me that we didn't do more research into the house to see if there was ever a problem or a tragedy there. I don't live far from there currently, but there's a good chance that the house and many others were demolished in a housing project. Either way, I feel it's best left as is. Just a creepy story. I'm now 26. I have a love of horror movies and creepy places. Maybe my exposure to these terrifying events flipped a couple adrenaline switches in my head. I still don't have a definite answer to whether ghosts truly exist or not but I can't deny what I went through in the house in West Bountiful. My sorority house is about a hundred years old. I lived in it last year and I will again this coming year. I love living there and I love ghosts and creepy things, obviously, but that house is starting to genuinely scare me. So, pledges are told a story before initiation about a supposed member who died in the 60s and now she haunts the house and the pledges. We tell this elaborate story and really spook the girls, even turning off the lights and banging on doors and windows for effect. When the story was told to me, I thought it was just a joke to tease the pledges because they spend the night in the house after we tell that story. But I started asking some of the older members about it. Some said it was fake, and some really believed the house was haunted. Older members who had lived in the house told me their experiences with the ghost. And now, I have a few of my own after living in the house. One of my friends is very sensitive to ghosts and spirits. She sees them when nobody else can. She can feel if they are male or female, good or bad, etc. Ever since she was a kid, she has had experiences, like going into a house for sale and knowing that somebody died there, seeing dead relatives, etc. She hates it and doesn't like to talk about it, but I find it so interesting, so I always ask her about her encounters. She doesn't like being in the house, and has not and will not live in it. She especially hates the basement. She has gone into the basement and heard growling, and another girl even heard a man scream when she was alone in the basement. The girls have seen people walk through the hall, and when they go to look, nobody will be there. My friend saw a rocking chair start moving drastically when she was alone and came to my room screaming. The basement, and for whatever reason, feet are common themes for these ghosts. The room I was in was also somewhat of a hot spot for activity in the house. I shared my room with another girl, and she thinks it's my fault that we had experiences. The first night we lived in the house was an August night with no air conditioning. It was so dang hot that nobody could move or sleep. I jokingly told the ghost to hang out in our room since ghosts usually cool down a room. I totally thought it was a joke, and I obviously didn't think anything would happen. My roommate was mad. Back to my ghost-seeing friend, she told me she had a dream that she followed a man around our house, and he was cutting the bottom of the girl's feet while they slept. She asked him why he was doing this, and he said, so they'll feel better. My roommate also had a dream that a man came into our room and told us that we had to die so he put poison on the floor and said that if we stepped on it, we would die. 
Another friend of mine who didn't live in the house also had a dream that she found me dead in my room. Nice, right? I also have felt my feet being grabbed at night, a woman whisper in my ear, and someone stroking my shoulder. I sometimes would get sleep paralysis in high school, but I never had it in college until I lived in that house. I also started to sleepwalk, which I had never done until living there. One girl also found me in the hallway on the second floor. Mind you, I lived on the third floor. I was staring at a composite, which is a big picture we take every year of the girls in the sorority, basically a yearbook and a picture frame. I was standing in front of one of the 50s or 60s ones and she asked me what I was doing and I said, picture. And she said, what? And I said, ghost and pointed to one of the women. I don't remember this at all and I was really freaked out when she told me. I had my ghost seeing buddy look at the composite that I had apparently been looking at. A name came to her mind and sure enough, when we googled it, it was the lady who was in our house a long time ago who had died. She wasn't pictured, she wasn't the one that I was looking at, but it was interesting that her name came to my friend's mind. I was enjoying the activity in the house that I was experiencing since nothing was aggressive or super scary. I mean, the feet thing creeped me out a little bit, but mostly it was pretty tame. Until one night. I was dead asleep in my bed, and all of a sudden I heard this really loud bang and my bed shook. I felt like somebody had been standing at the foot of my bed and was just pounding on the bed frame. I shot up in bed and nobody was there. My roommate was dead asleep. I don't know how she didn't wake up. I sat there for a few minutes, not knowing what to do. I posted on Snapchat about it, and my sensitive friend messaged me and asked if I was okay. I told her that I was, and she told me that she had shot up in bed having a pure panic attack and felt the urge to message me asking if I was alright. Then she saw my Snapchat and started freaking out because we had woken up at the exact same time. She didn't even want to go into my room after that because she said she could feel something very negative there. She said there was an angry male ghost and a female ghost that was just sort of there. She could see her, but she was not afraid of her. A few days after that night, my friend and roommate were looking at old photos from the sorority. We used to have men who would clean and do dishes and they would sleep in the basement, our bus boys. They were flipping through old photos of bus boys and my roommate started to freak out and pointed to one of them, saying that was the man in her dreams that had poured the poison on the floor. Other girls have seen men's feet in the bathroom stalls, even though no men are allowed on living floors or living floor bathrooms. I never saw a male ghost, but I did see the female ghost, and it is the only ghost I have ever seen. I was walking into our house one night at around 11 p.m. There's a mirror on the side of the entry that, if you look at it, you can see a couch in the living room. I walked in and looked in the mirror, I don't really know why, and I saw a woman sitting on the couch with her hair up in a bun. She was also in a fancy, old-timey purple dress. She had her hands on her lap and was looking right at me. It was just a second that I saw her as I walked by the mirror. When I walked past the living room, nobody was on the couch. I went back and looked in the mirror, and she was gone. I get chills just thinking about it. There was another girl in the house before I was in the sorority, who was also sensitive to spirits. She was Native American and practices a lot of the old ways, as she puts it. She said that she could sense two spirits in the house, one harmless and one demonic that meant to harm people. She doesn't really talk about it much, but she could always feel it, was chased by a shadow figure, and even saged her room and refused to go into the basement at night. She even thought about calling a priest to the house. She said for some reason, it is hard for the demonic presence to get into our rooms. But did I accidentally invite it into mine when I made that joke for them to hang out in our room? We also had stuff move in our room for no reason. We would hear walking above us in the middle of the night, 
even though above us is just an empty attic. And my roommate even saw a female ghost sitting on my bed while I was sleeping in it. There are so many other stories and encounters that friends have told me, like their iPads flying across the room and doors getting locked for no reason, but this story is long enough. I'm excited to live in the house again this year. I move in in two weeks, but I'm in a different room this time that is isolated in the back of the house near the attic, and a lot of stuff happens there too. My friend is going to sage my old room for the poor girls that have to live in it this year, and she's saging my new room since I'm all by myself, and I really don't want any ghostly roommates. I don't know what's really in that house. It is fun to have little expeditions, but things were kind of intense by the end of that year. The bed thing really scared me, and I have no idea what I'm in store for when I go back. This all took place six years ago when I was 14, so bear with me. Now, the backstory on this house is quite odd because the official report of the incident that took place here was coincidentally lost. I know it sounds fake and unreal, but I swear on my life that it's true. No one has found the incident report. Although the story of the house was known by most kids, grandparents, and parents who lived near the house at the time, the incident occurred back in the late 80s or early 90s. The house was occupied by a family of four. The father of the household took the lives of his two children and his wife as they slept, and then he himself went into the basement and took his own life. The neighbor immediately reported the incident after hearing a gunshot from the house. The cops arrived, asked questions, took statements from the neighbors, and removed the bodies. Some of the residents who used to live in that area told the cops that the father of the family wasn't a violent man, and that he wouldn't just go and off his family like he did, and that he must have been demon-possessed. From then on, up to the day that the building was torn down after I had been there overnight for a sleepover, it was reported to be haunted. Like, very haunted. My friend, let's call him Mike, invited me over for a sleepover at his parents' rental, which just happened to be this house. At this time, I loved ghosts and the paranormal, but he didn't tell me that the house was haunted until I arrived there. I was a little bit skeptical. But even his parents backed him up with the story that I just told you. I arrived at the house, and he had everything packed up from his Xbox 360 to snacks and drinks. All I had was my backpack full of games and my to-go box from Waffle House, which contained two chocolate chip waffles. This is an important detail for later, I promise. We started to head down to the rental, which was in the same neighborhood as Mike's house. We arrived at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The house looked quite nice, and its simple layout with a separated two-car garage was charming. Just to give you a feel and insight of the house's layout, when you walk in the front door, immediately to your left was the living room. Behind that was the kitchen. Next to the kitchen, across from where the front door was, is the foyer. And the dining room and behind the dining room was the back door to the back porch. As you walk toward the dining room, the hallway was to your right. On the left of the hallway is first the door to the basement, next a small closet, and next to that was the first bedroom, and across from that was the second. To your immediate right in the hallway was the full hall bathroom. The master bedroom was located directly in the back. When you enter the master bedroom, the bathroom is on your immediate right. To the left of the bathroom is a medium walk-in closet. Across from where you're standing is the bed against the wall with no footboard. Remember that for later. Mike set up his Xbox and I put all the food in the fridge. We immediately started to play video games and after we got the system up and running, we had about an hour or so of play. There was no activity whatsoever, nothing paranormal. I eventually got up to get my to-go box and eat my waffles because I was tired of Doritos. When I opened the fridge, no joke, swear on my life, 
I noticed that my to-go box was open and that one of my waffles was missing. I knew it wasn't Mike who took it because he was in the living room with me the entire time. So I grabbed the to-go box and brought it back into the living room and I told him what I encountered. He thought it was kind of odd, but then he joked back saying maybe the ghost wanted some real food. After about 20 minutes of video gaming, we hear a door slam shut. We just looked at each other for a minute and Mike told me to stop smiling so much because it looked creepy that I was excited to finally catch something paranormal. Mike told me to go check on it and without much hesitation, I did. I wasn't afraid, I was more curious. I slowly walked down the hall, checking each room, nothing out of the ordinary. When I reached the master bedroom, nothing was out of place. Nothing was on the bed. Then I heard the water running, which I did not hear when I entered the room, and the door to the bathroom was open, not closed. Same as a closet door. So I don't know what door could have slammed shut. Everything was open. I called Mike in to show him the running water. We entered the bathroom, turned the water off, and started looking around to see if anything was out of place, but nothing else was out of the ordinary. It wasn't until we started to leave when Mike stopped dead in his tracks. I asked him what was wrong, and all he did was point to the bed. It was then that I realized that my waffle that had disappeared was on the bottom right corner of the bed on a styrofoam plate. I told Mike to go to the end of the hall and asked if he could see it, and he said that he could but he swears up and down that when he walked into the room to check out my find, he didn't see it on the bed, and I hadn't seen it when I walked in either. He told me that if it was on the bed, you could have seen it as clear as day. We thought it was spooky, but personally, I loved it. We returned to the living room and played some more while discussing what we had just seen. After about 40 minutes, we get the jump scare of our lives. All the cupboards and drawers in the kitchen opened and slammed simultaneously. We both just about jumped out of our skin. I went to check it out, but it was just crazy to think that all the cupboards and drawers just opened and slammed at the same time. A few minutes later, we heard a small clang coming from the basement. We both ruled out the heater, it was the middle of summer, and the AC because the AC was already on. It was at this point that Mike decided to get out of there because he was officially creeped out. I, on the other hand, opted to play my game. He asked me if anything had happened since he left. And the craziest thing happened. As soon as I said no, a loud bang comes from the basement. It literally sounded like somebody had taken a crowbar and hit a barrel with it. I immediately rushed to the basement door I'm a little hesitant at first, but I open the door and flick on the light and run down the stairs with my phone. Mike is dead silent on the other end. And then he breaks the silence as I'm searching for the sound of the bang. He says, is there anything down there? I said, no. The basement is finished and is quite big and fully furnished. I see and hear nothing, so I go to leave. I was halfway up the stairs when I heard what sounded like a man moaning in pain at the bottom of the steps. I take off up the steps, slam the door, and locked it. I asked Mike if he had heard it on his end and he said that he did. That truly scared the crap out of me. I reluctantly regained my composure and told Mike that I was still going to stay through the night. He told me I was crazy. The true reason I stayed was because I had always wanted to be a paranormal investigator, and I thought this was my chance to prove myself. I ended up staying the whole night, playing video games. The paranormal activity did not stop, it was very frequent. Every few minutes I'd hear one of the door slams, or one of the sinks would start running. At one point, all the doors shut at once, except for the basement front and back door since they were already closed. The second most creepy incident was when I heard the shower in the master bedroom come on. I went to check it out and turned it off 
By this point, I was more annoyed than intrigued because the only thing these ghosts seemed to want to do was mess with me. So anyway, I'm leaving the bathroom, and I scan the master for anything out of place. Sure enough, I see it. It was small at first, but then it got bigger. It was on the bed. It looked like someone or something was sitting on the edge of the bed, and then started to lay on the bed, but nothing was visible except for the indent they were making. I quickly called Mike and told him what I saw. He flipped out and told me that I should leave and get out of there. I told him to relax, that I was going to be fine. For the rest of the night, the door slamming continued, along with random drawers and cabinets being opened when I knew that they had been closed. Also, water was running from random faucets, and the ghostly stuff ended up wanting to dump trash all over the kitchen. Finally, the sun came up, and I hadn't gotten a single moment of sleep. I packed up and went to Mike's house and told his parents that I had to keep the house tidy because the ghost really loved trashing the place. This part is the third creepiest thing. When I got back to my house, Mike called me. He sounded absolutely frantic. I told him to calm down and just tell me what was wrong. He said a little bit after I left his house, his parents went with him back to the rental. He and his parents entered the house only for it to be completely upside down. The furniture was flipped over, the kitchen was a disaster with water running, utensils on the floor, and silverware everywhere. Trash was on the floor, as well as all the contents of the fridge, but there was no sign of forced entry or a break-in, and I know that I made sure all the doors and windows were locked before I left. This incident, though, is what really, really sealed the deal for me. Mike told me that when they opened the basement door, the inside of the door had a long, large, deep scratch, multiple scratches, all carved into it. Obviously, this scared me and my friend because whatever did that to the door probably could have done that to me while I was in the basement the night before. The house was demolished a year later and the ground it stood on was blessed by a local Catholic priest. A new home now stands there, but nobody has witnessed anything paranormal. Yet. You never know. Evil has said to come back a time or two. There are a few things I want to point out before starting. The first is that I will not repeat the name of what we called the ghost at the property that I lived at. The second is that I do believe that whatever was living at my house was not a ghost at all. I moved into a house that was built in the late 1880s that had a lot of history with the town I lived in. The houses on the plot that I lived on were original to the citrus farming community that was developing at the time. Our landlord owned three homes that sat basically on one plot. We had no backyard and shared a makeshift parking lot in the back of the properties. The main farmhouse was our next door neighbor. It was where the original builder of the home lived. The house that I lived in was the farm worker's house and the house that was behind us was an old carriage house that had been converted into a very small house. It was in the downtown areas of Southern California, in a railroad town. I'm a history buff, so I found it odd that most of the original charm had been stripped away from the interior and exterior of the home. It was a five-bedroom house that I shared with four other women. When I moved in, I took the smallest and only room downstairs. The girl that I was replacing had mentioned that she had felt uncomfortable in her room and had attempted to bless the room with holy oil. She had felt like someone was standing over her while she studied and slept, that she had seen a black figure in her room, and that she felt watched. Later on, I had a roommate admit that as she was alone watching television downstairs, my bedroom door, during the previous tenant's stay had opened on its own. 
I can confirm that the carpet is very thick and it was frequently difficult to open the door all the way. When I was in that room, I never felt that I was being watched, experienced cold spots, or even seen shadow figures appear in my room. For whatever reason, whatever was in our house stayed out of what I refer to as my sacred space. It did, however, commit havoc in other ways. When I first moved into the house, our roommates had a name for the ghost that lived there. They would frequently talk or joke about it. They would openly talk about it in the house and all the experiences that they had had there. Anything and everything that was happening in our home. Footsteps, things being moved, doors opening, tapping on the windows, shadow figures, voices and conversations. I wasn't 100% comfortable talking about it in the house because it seemed like it would just add fuel to the fire. A few days later, my roommates were boasting about the ghost. I got locked out of my bedroom. That type of lock on the door was one that you can stick the fine metal key to release, but I physically had to take the entire door apart to get back in because the locking mechanism would not release. My roommate came home to find me putting the door back together and I explained what had happened. Later that afternoon, she found herself locked out of her room and she had to take the door apart to get back in as well. The coincidence made me uncomfortable, but I tried to be rational and chalk it up to school brain. A few things happened that year, but nothing too crazy or frightening. About a year after my move, one of my roommates upstairs moved out and I took the opportunity to move up there to the master bedroom of the house. It was a great upgrade, and I was very relieved to be out of my tiny room downstairs. We also got a few new roommates, including one that was very interested in rituals, cards, crystals, and everything new age. She picked up right away that something was going on with the house, but what was there was harmless and possibly an old occupant of the house. At least that's what she said. To be honest, all of the moving stirred up the activity. It didn't help that we were still staying and recognizing this ghost by name. Shortly after everyone moved in, we had a housewarming get-together. We had several people that picked up right away that something was off about the house. We talked to them about the activity and told them some of our stories. Right away, the house started getting very active. My old bedroom door that was now unoccupied began to open, and a few hours later, there was a knocking at our front door with nobody there. It creeped all of us out because whatever was listening was happy to respond, indicating that it was intelligent and not something that was just residual. It was shortly after this time that the house started to get very scary. My first scary experience began when I was studying alone in the house. I heard my roommate's car and heard her come through our back door into our kitchen to make lunch. What I think happens next was that she came upstairs and started getting ready to study in her room. The next thing I hear is what I thought was her walk down the hall and into my locked roommate's room where stuff starts knocking over and into the next roommate's room where she's pacing around. My actual roommate was downstairs sitting on the couch eating lunch while whatever this thing was was rampaging around the other rooms. The reason I knew it wasn't her was because I could hear her laughing downstairs at whatever show she was watching. I texted her immediately and confirmed that she had never gone up the stairs. She thought I was moving around upstairs, but was afraid to ask me what was wrong. Meanwhile, I was petrified at my desk. I waited until it died down before I tore downstairs to sit with her on the couch. Over the next month, things got really bad. On a regular basis, I could hear and feel something chasing me up the stairs where it would pace the hallway and go into all of the unoccupied rooms. There was frequently loud footsteps, stuff being knocked over, things like that. The most bone chilling experience was when I was vacuuming the hallway and I heard a loud woman scream in my right ear over the sound of the vacuum. I turned the vacuum off and the sound continued for a few seconds before it stopped. 
Even telling the story now, my hair stands up on end. My boyfriend, now my husband, would be on the phone with me when I was stuck in my room because something was pacing outside my door. Nothing ever crossed the threshold of my door. At the time, my rational side thought I was losing touch with reality, but my instinctual side knew to protect myself from the predator that was out there. I would never sleep with my closet door open. It made me uncomfortable. We could hear converse energy she had sensed in the house was overshadowed by this terrible negative energy. All of us 100% agreed. At that time, we stopped calling it by the name we gave it. We cleansed the house with sage. We opened the windows and made better choices supernaturally. We ignored the footsteps and did not talk openly about our experiences. The physical nature of the attacks disappeared almost entirely, but it took at least two months. That being said, after that, we all suffered psychologically with depression, anger, and anxiety. A lot of us even suffered financial and relationship problems. For me, it got so bad that I moved back in with my parents. What I didn't know until being completely moved out was how much better I got and how quickly I improved after my move. Do I think it was in part to the house feeding off of us? Absolutely. A few months later, I came by the house to spend time with one of my friends who still lives there. She moved into my room for the space, but her conversation quickly came to the supernatural. What she told me still gives me the chills. She woke up one night to two figures standing at the door of what used to be my closet. They moved quickly toward her, and she began to pray to Jesus. A deep and aggressive male voice began to mock her prayers. Most people that I ask about this say that it's possible she was experiencing sleep paralysis, but what freaks me out is that she had full movement of her limbs and was able to grab her phone and get out of the room. Obviously, not sleep paralysis. Whatever it was, in her dreams or in person, violated a space that I had felt was sacred and safe. I did learn a few things about the house and the properties that shared so much history and lore. The first thing is that while we were experiencing activity in our home, so were our neighbors. Second, part of the reason our home did not look original is because part of it burned down, including my downstairs bedroom. Third, a woman that owned and lived in our house was severely depressed and she took her own life off the property at a local hotel. I can't find any news clippings about this, but our neighbor was there when they were trying to find the woman. Finally, the bad energy messed with me, but did not cross the threshold of the door because I drew a line. I think we should all do the same when it comes to negative people and or energy. What I have learned from this whole experience is don't live in a house with any entities, people, or negative energy. You will not know how badly it affects you until you're out. Don't name anything. You don't know if it's a ghost or something else. Resist talking about it, period. Be careful nothing comes home with you. For a few days after my visit to my old house, something negative stuck to me and messed with my heart and mind. Pray often, have faith, and make your house a sacred space. A more accurate thing to say rather than I grew up in a haunted house would be that I grew up in a few haunted houses. Even now, we have an entity in our kitchen who we jokingly call the fridge ghost, as it likes to hang out by the fridge and occasionally open it in the middle of the night. But for now, I want to tell you about a house I lived in until I was in middle school. It's located on a street called Cherry which my friends and I always joked about for obvious reasons. However, nothing about the feeling I had when I lived in that house with my family was anything to joke about. My friends never wanted to spend the night there. All of them had the same bad feeling when they stayed there, this sinking feeling that formed in the pits of their stomachs before something would happen. And unusual things inevitably would, more often than not, happen. Doors would regularly open and close on their own. This was something that I chalked up to the tilt in the foundation, at least at first. But when you hear doors slam in the middle of the night, 
you start to question if it's just regular house noises. The windows would open and shut on their own as well, which is a little harder to pin on a shifting foundation. There were a couple of times that the televisions would turn on and off on their own as well. Sometimes the volume on the television sets would go up and down at, at will, and there were other times the channels would show up on the television sets that I have never seen except for on those sets. I could probably blame the odd television behavior on magnetism or the fact that both television sets were quite old. However, the strange things I would see on those off channels through the static are enough to convince me that there might have been something else going on there. I would often hear noises in the vents, like things were crawling around in them. Sometimes it sounded like bodies were being dragged through the ventilation shafts. Sometimes I would hear scratching on the walls or the windows, or other out of the ordinary sounds like footsteps on the floor when no one was there. My mom used to tell me that it was little woodland creatures who got inside the walls, but I never saw these animals. The closest I came to seeing anything close to an animal uh, was a family of skunks that we found living under our porch. But after moving them safely to the woods, we never saw any other animals that could account for making the types of noises that I was hearing. Sometimes I heard whispering, other times I heard yelling, like a faint cry through the walls. There were other times I would find weird yellow liquid on the walls, or other similar substances. My mom used to say it was mold and not to touch it until she could clean it up, but it sure didn't look like mold to me. It didn't look like any of those substances could be made by something living, or natural. I would also see ghostly figures wandering through the house. When I was young, I used to talk in great detail with what I thought was a child female entity. It was more like a one-way conversation with the entity, although sometimes it would answer in its own way. I wrote an essay about my friendship with that ghost for one of my classes later on, and submitted it as fiction to the teacher so she wouldn't think I was crazy. But the truth is that my friendship with that ghost and some of the other presences there were very real. Of course, there was the typical haunting stuff too, like objects being thrown, pulled, or just simply going missing altogether. I used to joke with my mom that the wall trolls or house gnomes had made off with our stuff, to which she would just roll her eyes. When my mom started seeing some strange entities peering at us through the windows or as we were sleeping, then she started to take my stories more seriously. She won't agree with everything that I've claimed to see at the house, but she will definitely admit that there were presences that would appear that we could not explain. I often saw toys come to life, including a doll my aunt had brought me from Russia. I had a dream that the doll was trying to kill me by choking me to death. When I woke up, the doll was sleeping next to me in bed. It wasn't there when I had fallen asleep. No one had ever moved it during the night. I ended up blessing the doll and throwing it away. And to this day, I don't like dolls and I won't sleep in the same room with one. I remember that the landlord who lived and never got any direct answers from the landlord, I could tell by her behavior that she must know something was wrong with the house. Perhaps the strangest thing was that the house didn't particularly have a dark past or history attached to it that would make it stand out as a hub for spiritual activity. The landlord was cranky and her attitude could have been contributing to the overall negative vibe there, but other than that, we never knew what in particular made the house haunted. I didn't exclusively see evil entities in the house either. Like I said, I made some friendships with the ghosts, and I even saw other entities, like what I can only describe as being little people, and entities that looked like greys, but they weren't aliens. This leads me to believe that the house was built on some sort of ley line or portal that opened up into other realms. Maybe a more accurate title would be that my house was a gateway. I'm not sorry that I had the experience that I did. In fact, I think it broadened my horizons and showed me from an early age that there is more to this world than what we can physically see. 
I will always think of the friendships I formed with the entities there, and I'll always think of them fondly. For some people, my experience might seem to have a rational explanation, and that's fine. I have always had an open mind, and I'm happy to listen to many sides of an argument. But for me, the experiences I had in this house growing up were tangible, and not just the imagination of an elementary school kid. They are something that has colored my view of this beautiful and mysterious world, and has opened my eyes to all kinds of realms of possibility. Welcome back. I do hope you all enjoyed tonight's tales of lost spirits and uninvited guests. If you did, consider subscribing and ringing the bell to summon more spooky stories whenever they're released. If you liked the video, I would be ever so appreciative if you would hit that like button as well. For those of you who have pledged on Patreon, thank you so much for your support. I will be posting September's $4 tier video coming this Monday, which is the last day of September, so stay tuned for that. Starting next month, I will have all of the reward tiers available, so if you're interested in and able to join the Patreon community, a link will be listed below where you can do so. S sorry about that. <laughs> As a reminder, there is now a Raven Reads community on Reddit. You can find the links for it in the video description, as well as links to all the various places you can find me on social media, as well as links to all of the stories read in tonight's video. Thank you so much for being here. I do hope you have a lovely evening. I will also try to jump on a live stream soon, but if I can't, then I will just make a premiere video for our uh, September wrap up and look ahead to October. I do like to update you guys once a month just to let you know what's been going on and what's about to go on so that you know what to expect. Night Marathon starts on Tuesday. Who's excited? I know I am. <laughs> I will see you very soon for more spooky stories. And of course, we're going to have a wonderful October. So until then, have a fantastic evening, and I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now. Ooh.